Good morning. It's a privilege to be here and uh, to open the Word of God and to uh, uh, share with you something I feel very strongly that God has put on my heart. I also would like to just give you a little bit of a commercial, if that's okay. Um, Amen. While we're doing, while, if you came in late and didn't get the announcement on where the sermon notes are, you can actually find them on your smartphone at the Uversion app. Some, it's called the Bible app sometimes, but you can get it on your phone. Look, look for live. If you, if you hit live and then it'll ask for your zip code, and just put 85338 in there and then you'll find a, a message entitled The Shadows of Grace and then you'll be following along right with me. The scripture verses are all loaded in there and, and everything. So, And if you've got an account with them, you can actually put in your own notes and save them and it's a really cool thing. So try it out. I tried this at the college the other day, uh, a few weeks ago, when I was preaching in chapel there. And I told them a couple days ahead of time, now I'm preaching in chapel on Wednesday, and I want to make sure that you bring your cell phones and have them on. <laughs> so, we had fun that day. Hey, my thing's gone wacky here. Just a second. <laughs> Electronics. There we go. It has to be on 150%. It shrunk down to 75 on me, and I was in trouble. Okay. American Indian College. We've got a little table over there, some, some material. Uh, that is the mission that God has sent us on. After uh, living for a long time in Illinois, God spoke to our heart about coming to Phoenix and to work at American Indian College. We started there on the faculty, and uh, I pastored for 20 years in the state of Illinois. We came here to teach and, and, and uh, had an incredible time. Along the way, God has, has asked us to take some other roles, and now I'm the president. So after that, it's trouble. <laughs> That's so right. there's nowhere to go from there. So, um, but uh, it's a it's a privilege. Uh, God has blessed us, and we're just thankful. We have our challenges, as as all of us do, but God is helping us. And uh, American Indian College, uh, we get two of the, the two most asked questions we get nowadays is, do you have to be Native American to go there? The answer is no. In fact, 40% of our students are not Native Americans. They're not tribally registered. We have a whole potpourri of, of folks. We have Hispanics and Filipinos and Samoans and, and a white person or two sprinkled in there. <laughs> and, uh, um, and, uh, but uh, you can come. Another question we get asked a lot is, do you have online classes? The answer to that is yes as well. We have a limited number of online classes. We're not yet approved by the accrediting body to offer full programs yet, but you can uh, earn up to 49% of a degree program at American Indian College using the online delivery system. And for those that are close, that can be quite convenient because you can minimize the time that you have to spend either living on campus or on traveling back and forth. And so uh, we've had an increasing number of students that have, that have worked on their degrees in that kind of a blended system and uh, so God is helping us so keep keep us in mind uh, we're affordable <laughs> remember that you can get a private Pentecostal higher education right here in the Valley of the Sun for the same price as Arizona State's in-state tuition oh, okay. think about that Okay, and if you could even qualify for some federal money. So uh, think about that. And when you're considering college and you say, well, I'll think about that when my kids get old enough or something like that. The average age of the American Indian College first year student is 27.4 years. <laughs> so, so, you know, God speaks at folks along at some point in their lives and, and calls them to either get some higher education or to, or to prepare for ministry. So be, be ready when God speaks to your heart. And we'd like to come alongside of you and help you in your preparation. So I think you've got a card passed out. So there's some vital information on their website, all that sort of thing. If you could, will you help us spread the good news about American Indian College? American Indian College is the best kept secret in Arizona. And I'm working very hard to change that. So thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for praying for us, for our ministry and for our family. You have truly uh, been a blessing to us. And we appreciate uh, the way that you've shared your lives with us and allowed us to share ours in, in some small way. Um, would you turn with me, please, to the book of Psalms? Psalm 44. Occasionally there are passages of scripture. Sometimes there are a verse, a chapter, a story, in this case an entire psalm, a prayer, if you will, 
from the Old Testament that, that God would just grab my mind and my heart and keep calling me back there. I would say for at least six months, this has been one of those passages of scriptures that I've been just kind of wandering back to. I sense the Spirit leading me back there. In fact, I didn't realize until a week or so ago when I started collecting some thoughts and notes on paper um, that began to realize that I've been looking at this passage, or on screen as it were, <laughs> I've been looking at this passage from several different translations of the Bible, several different Bibles, and every one I looked up I had like things underlined and and notes in the margin and everything and different thoughts coming to my brain at different times so it's kind of an interesting thing but uh, Psalm 44 the shadows of grace consider with me first off if you would the sun S-U-N sun you're familiar with the sun we, we know about the sun in Arizona don't we did you know that the sun comprises 99.9% of the total mass of our entire solar system. Think about that. Add up all the planets, all the asteroids, all the space junk, everything. It all adds up to 0.1% of the total mass. That's Jupiter, that's Saturn, that's Earth, all of them, all of the moons. The total mass, 99.9%. Actually, 99.86% of the total mass of the solar system is, is the sun itself. It's enormous. Consider its temperature. Anybody know how hot the sun is? It's real hot from here. Do you know how hot it is there? 15.6 million degrees Kelvin. I have no idea what Kelvin means. <laughs> Did a quick search and found out there's some sort of, it's somehow similar to Celsius and it's tied into absolute zero. And there's some sort of complicated way to figure out Kelvin to Fahrenheit, which sounded like too much work to me. I'm a college president, not a math teacher. So maybe I'll have to ask the math teacher to figure it out. But it's, it's tens of millions of degrees. Think about that. That's hot. 120? Ha! 15.6 million. It's 93 million miles away, average. 93 million miles away. It's a long way away. And now consider God, the maker of what seems to be billions of stars like the sun think of that and God created humans you and me and he put us on this microscopic in fact in, 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 in terms of the size of the universe this sub microscopic piece of dust calls earth and God created you and me, and he put us here. And he gives us his attention and his love. And he put this little piece of earth in exact relationship with the massive sun so that it would create for us an environment in which we could live and grow crops, regenerate. So that we could live in harmony and in connection with him for his glory. Wow. In this part of the world, we understand the dramatic difference that can occur between standing in the sunlight and standing in the shadows. It cracked me up when we first moved to Phoenix. First summer, we moved in the middle of the summer. And I saw, I would drive along the streets and see any little sliver of shadow. A light pole would be casting just a little bit of shadow. Then there'd be someone standing in it. Anything to do to find just a little, just a little speck of shade of relief from that ball of gas. 93 million miles away. 
This time of year, it's very interesting in the winter because we can stand out when the sun's out. You can stand out. It's like 40 degrees, not very often, but it's like 40 degrees and we can stand out in the sun and it's comfortable. Who needs a coat? I'm in Arizona, man. But you can step over six inches into a shady spot. (sighs) (sighs) I'm putting sunblock on over here and I'm wearing my wide brimmed hat and I turn over here and I'm putting on my mittens. Because of the sun, the, the radiance of the sun, its rays are incredible. And so we spend our entire lives living in the sunlight Or in the shadows. But never both. Mm -hmm. You cannot stand in the sunlight and in the shadow at the same time. Doesn't work that way. It's one or the other. Let's look together, if you would, at Psalm 44. Now, it's kind of long. I know we have short attention spans nowadays. But I want to read the whole thing, if that's okay, because it it goes together. So here we go. Psalm 44, verse 1. We have heard it with our ears, O God. Our ancestors have told us what you did in their days, in days long ago. With your hand, you drove out the nations and planted our ancestors. You crushed the peoples and made our ancestors flourish. It was not by their sword that they won the land, nor did their arm bring them victory. It was your right hand, your arm, and the light of your face, for you love them. You are my king and my God, who decrees victories for Jacob. Through you, we push back our enemies. Through your name, we trample our foes. I put no trust in my bow. My sword does not bring me victory, but you... Give us victory over our enemies. You put our adversaries to shame. In God, we make our boast all day long, and we will praise your name forever. But now you have rejected and humbled us. You no longer go out with our armies. You made us retreat before the enemy, and our adversaries have plundered us. You gave us up to be devoured like sheep and have scattered us among the nations. You sold your people for a pittance, gaining nothing from their sale. You've made us a reproach to our neighbors, the scorn and derision of those around us. You have made us a byword among the nations. The people shake their heads at us. I live in disgrace all day long, and my face is covered with shame at the taunts of those who reproach and revile me because of the enemy who is bent on revenge. All this came upon us, though we had not forgotten you. We had not been false to your covenant. Our hearts had not turned back. Our feet had not strayed from your path. But you crushed us and made us a haunt for jackals. You covered us over with deep darkness. If we had forgotten the name of our God or spread out our hands to a foreign God, would not God have discovered it since he knows the secrets of the heart? Yet for your sake, we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. Awake, Lord. Why do you sleep? Rouse yourself. Do not reject us forever. Why do you hide your face and forget our misery and oppression? We are brought down to the dust. Our bodies cling to the ground. Rise up and help us. Rescue us because of your unfailing love. There are times when we live full on in the glory of God. We bask in his face. We revel in the gracious gifts that he gives to us. There are times when we just know that God is among us and he is pouring out his victories and he is pouring out his blessings. Firmly embedded in God's Old Testament people was the idea that the favor of God 
on a person could be readily seen by the evident blessings of grace. Look at these passages. Psalm 44, 3, we just read that. It was not by their sword that they won the land, nor did their arm bring them the victory. It was your right hand, your arm, the light of your face. Remember that, the light of your face, for you love them. Number 6, 24 through 26, it's the, it's the priestly blessing that pastor speaks to us every day, every Sunday. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance. That's another word for face. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Psalm 97, 11, light shines on the righteous and joy on the upright in heart. And so the formula seems to be very straightforward, that if God is pleased with me, I will be blessed and I will be blessed with, in many ways, I will be blessed with health and abundant crops. I'll have a lot of children. My army will be victorious. I don't have an army right now. Anybody here have an army? And from the testimony of his ancestors in verses 1 through 3, the psalmist recounted that. Did you notice that? He says, My, our ancestors, our fathers, uh, uh, they were victorious because you were with them. And so from the testimony of his ancestors, which is, which is passed down to them in the written word and in the story, the narrative of God's people, he constructs a theology of victory. In verses 4 through 8, you see that he takes their experience and constructs his own belief system out of that. Because of what has happened to them, and because what they have passed down to me, this is what I believe. And he puts his anchor down and he stakes his claim. I believe that I am victorious because, God, you are victorious for them. And we as God's New Testament people, we have... Taken, we've inherited from them this, this looking to the Lord. Of course, we, we know that it's his word and it's the power of his Holy Spirit to shine brightly upon us, to grant us success and blessing. It's slightly different in the New Testament in, in some, some wonderful ways. In fact, one of the very uh, uh, wonderful Expressions of the Jesus story, if you will, the Christmas story that we look that we're beginning to do this year is that in the incarnation, God literally takes on flesh. Emmanuel, God with us, embodies God's glory. His shining, radiant face is embodied in Jesus Christ. As John 1, 14 says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen His glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. No one has, verse 18, no one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side, He has made Him known. God took all of His presence, all of His glory, all of His awesomeness. The, the God who created the billion sons embodied himself in the person of Jesus Christ. And we have seen him, John said. So the glory of God no longer simply shines on us, we understand now. But the glory of God shines in us. And the glory of God shines from us. To them, God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. From that glory of God flows power. God doing what only God can do. From the power of that glory comes transformation. God changing us. Changing circumstances, turning this world right side up and reordering our lives. From the glory of God flows blessing, his provision. It's an awesome thing. Of course, all this is tempered. The psalmist understood that. It's tempered with a deep understanding of grace, that this is something we don't earn after all. 
There's something interesting about that. It's not either or, it's both and. That, that God will favor me because I am pleasing to him, but his favor also is not dependent upon my pleasing him. Well, how can that be? Well, because that's God. We do either or better. God does both and better. God is gracious to us. We don't merit his worthiness. He imparts worthiness to us. I'm not worthy. Jesus is worthy. Jesus lives in me. So now Jesus is worthy. So I get God's blessings. Not because I'm worthy, but because Jesus is worthy. God's active glory in our lives is not based on our worthiness, our efforts, but on God's love and God's purposes. The glory. To be in the sunshine of God's radiant glory. More than the Arizona sunshine. God's glory is an amazing thing. And an awesome thing. But. But. There are times. That we live in the shadowy places. Where the blessings from God's grace. Seem few and far between. Almost as if. We were somehow shielded from God's glory. The psalmist understood that beginning in verse 9 all the way down through verse 25. Is this confusion, this struggle, this wondering about the shadowy place that he found himself in. And so we get this, well, if faithfulness... And favor produce glory and blessing. Then what does a setback mean? (laughs) One commentator suggests that this psalm was written during the faithful reigns of King Jehoshaphat or Hezekiah when things were going very well, that God, God's people were worshiping him in righteousness and in holiness and God was blessing them and they had a faithful king and things were going pretty well. For the most part. But a setback. Where do setbacks come from? How does this happen? How does this square with the radiance and the presence of God? Is it my fault? Have I done something wrong? The psalmist has gotten to the point where apparently he's heard about it, but wasn't seeing it, that glory of God. Remember, We heard about them. They've told us the story and we've formulated our theology. But where is it? Our armies are being defeated. Our crops are failing. What's going on? Where was the divine intervention that he so longed for? He was tired of hearing the stories. He wanted a reality. Have you ever been there? His theology of victory was being sorely tested. In those times, the psalmist kind of did this number. He, he's, he begins to go through the list. And he checks it twice. And every time he comes up with the same result. We're not naughty, we're nice. <laughs> We haven't forsaken you. We've been loyal. We've been faithful. What's going on here? Aren't you you glad that that's in the Bible? Makes you feel better, doesn't it? You thought you were the only one who thought that way. Well, if I'm not to blame, perhaps God is. Has God forgotten about me? Has he forgotten to pay attention to me? Can you feel the disappointment? Look at it. Compare verse 3 with verse 24. Verse 3. The light of your face shone on our ancestors. You delighted in them. And then in verse 24. Why do you hide your face from us? 
In fact, earlier it says, you've cast us into darkness. You shone brightly on them. And we're feeling around in the dark. It can certainly feel sometimes like God is looking the other way. That the shining face of God's favor is directed at somebody else. And you're left here, struggling, wondering, has God forgotten about me? So the psalmist leaves us with an ending. Oh no, we're to the end already? Yeah. Look at this, and, and this is an ending that doesn't really satisfy either. Maybe you notice that. Let, let me read it, and you've got it in front of you, in the message. Get up, God! Are you going to sleep all day? Wake up! Don't you care what happens to us? Why do you bury your face in the pillow? Why pretend things are just fine with us? And here we are, flat on our faces in the dirt, held down with a boot on our necks. Get up and come to our rescue. If you love us so much, help us! Wow! Hey, if the psalmist can pray like that and it gets printed in the Bible, you can pray like that. <laughs> so what happens? Does the glory return? Do the people finally find that sin hidden deep in their hearts and repent of it? Was, did they find among the army a greedy man like Achan that had to be rooted out in stone? Did they ever get their mojo back? Don't know. Not the end of the story, just the end of the prayer. When I was preparing this message, I had a real temptation to make this the end of the sermon. Maybe I should. That would be very unsatisfying. Because it's the same for you and me. Whether we are baking in the rays of God's wonderful glory or shivering in the shadows of struggle, what happens next? I don't know. Don't know what's next. Not the end of the story. But there's one thing, if we look just a little closer, there's one thing the psalmist remained convinced of, and so can we. Whether we're in the sunshine or we're in the shadows, you can count on God's love. See, this, the person who wrote the psalms, is, he's just not a schmuck, he's a wordsmith. Every word means something in the whole book and in the psalm. If you notice, maybe you've noticed that he's been taking us on a verbal journey. Verses 1 through 3. The testimony of his ancestors became the psalmist's theology. We talked about that in verses 4 through 8. But the truths he believed were secondhand to him. Until he was tested. And I love when they all start with T's. Isn't that great for the pastor that they all start with T's? I, I don't work in it that. If they don't come together that easy, I don't work that hard. But the testimony of his ancestors became his theology. But his theology needed to be tested by struggle, by weakness, by disappointment. By now, with the last word of his song, he arrives at the destination, finally. With the last word, he comes to a place of trust. The last word is the Hebrew word chesed. What'd you say? So I was just clearing, no, I wasn't just clearing my throat, I was saying it. Chesed. More than 200 times that Hebrew word appears. The unshakable, steadfast, covenant love of God for his people. 
He says, redeem me for the sake of your steadfast love. Elijah was a prophet. Remember Elijah? What do you think about when you think about Elijah? (laughs) Thus saith the Lord, it will not rain except at my word. And we think about Elijah standing up to the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel and he says, choose you this day, who will you serve? Is it going to be the Baal or is it going to be God? And he, and he pours the water over the sacrifice and he prays in front of all the people and the, and the fire of God comes down. Now, if that isn't sunshine radiance, I don't know what is. Whoa. There are times when I want, why can't I call down fire from heaven? Probably because I call it down on the wrong people at the wrong time. That's probably why. I'd call it down at a Board of Regents meeting or something. (laughs) Elijah lived most of his life in the shadow. Most of his life he lived in the shadow. He showed up, made a proclamation, and disappeared. (laughs) Back to the shadow. He lived for a long time along that brook, that that little stream. And he stayed there as long as the ravens fed him. And then the streams dried up and the ravens quit bringing him whatever they brought him. And I don't want to think about what they brought him. (laughs) Because I'm thinking they're probably similar to the big black birds that feast on the roadkill out here. That's not a shadowy place. I don't know what is. And then God moves him. Word, Lord says, go live with the widow. Poor widow. So Elijah shows up. Man of God calls down fire. Shows up at the poor widow's house. And she's just living her and her son. And they, they have just enough bread, wheat, to make one loaf of bread. And then they're going to die. And Elijah, man of faith and power, says, give me some first. <laughs> He's, we, we think that's selfishness. It's just desperation. He's starving to death. The, the ravens haven't even been feeding him. God takes care of him and that widow and her son. They, literally, they have enough to make today's food every day. And this goes on and on. Then Elijah gets called out and we do the, we do the prophets of Baal thing and the, the fire comes down from heaven and the drought ends and the, the rain falls and, and Elijah runs down the mountain and we think, oh, the sunshine, the glory of God's presence, it's a wonderful thing, but it's a fleeting thing. Because it's not, but almost immediately that Elijah finds himself in the depths of despair He's being pursued by by the queen and he goes off. He starts questing after God. He goes to Horeb and he takes this lonely pilgrimage. And when he finally gets there, he hears the voice of the Lord say, Elijah, go out and stand on the mountain. I think this passage is in your outline. The Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave i got to confess to you, as soon as I would see the wind breaking boulders, that's God, I'm heading on out. No, he waited. The earthquake, oh, that's got to be the footsteps of God, I'm heading out to talk to God. No, it was when the gentle whisper, and he said, ah, I remember the whisper. I've heard that whisper before, I've heard it at the stream. As the ravens were feeding me, I've heard that whisper that told me to go and stay with the widow. I've I've heard that whisper all along. Ah, that whisper I recognize. And he covered his face to 
go out and speak with God. The Lord loves me and you too much to leave our trust untested. It's fine to have a, a good theology. If, if you got a bad theology, you're on the wrong track. Got to, then you have to fix that. But even your good theology has to be tested, tried. See, God is invested in me. He's invested in you. What do you mean, God? He paid for you. With the blood of Jesus Christ. We just remembered that during communion. He's invested in me. He's put everything, the dearest thing to God's heart. He gave to bring you and me back into his family to redeem us. Remember the psalmist says, redeem me. You see, in the end, it's not about me anyway. It's not about whether, whether I'm in the sunshine or the shadows, or I, whether I'm successful or feeling good or got my mojo. It doesn't matter. What matters is God. What matters is Jesus. What matters is the glory of God not shining on me. What, it matters a whole lot more if the glory of God is transforming me and shining out from me is much more important. Paul says in Romans chapter 8, 31, what shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Yes, God is for us. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It's God who justifies. Whose fault is it? Who cares? Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus, who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. And here's the good part, if that wasn't good enough. Who shall separate us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword. As it is written, for your sake, we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. Paul was even thinking about Psalm 44 when he was writing this. That's a direct quote from Psalm 44. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Hallelujah. You can be in the sunshine of God's glory. You can be in the shadows of God's presence. But either way, you are inseparable from God himself because of Jesus Christ. I suspect when we reach the end of this life, if we choose to, we might add up the time we've spent in the shadows compared with the time we've spent in the glory. And I suspect that we will find out that we have been in the shadows a whole lot more than we've experienced the glory. In fact, I won't take time now, but if you flip over, maybe do that this afternoon or this evening if you're going to watch the football game. If Hebrews 11 is to be believed, there is a multitude of God's people who have lived their entire lives in the shadows. Their whole life with hardly a glimpse of the radiance, but have maintained unbroken faith. I think I got it bad sometimes and remember that today there are people being tortured and they're dying for their faith. Living in the shadows. That last phrase of that song says it all. Redeem me according to your unfailing love. 
in the end, none of that stuff matters. Where I am, what, what the blessings are, what I'm experiencing. What really matters is make me yours. That's what redemption does. It makes us God's. Nothing else matters except who you belong to. The radiant glory is intermittent. Can I say even rare? For now. For now. Again, if you need a little encouragement, go to the end. Revelation 22. And we, there shall be no need of a sun there. We don't need the sun there. Because the Lord and Jesus Christ, they are the sun. They are the sun. And we will bask and we will live forever in the unbroken radiance of God's glory. Never to be in the shadows again. Ever. Ever. In the shadows, one can be shielded from the glory. But there's no shield from God's presence. And there's no shield from God's grace. And yes, the sunshine of God's glory is wonderful. But there's a sweetness in the shadows. That holy place. Where I can hear the gentle whispers of God. Don't reject the shadows. Embrace the shadows. Don't consider the shadows just that place I've got to endure until the glory breaks through. No. The shadows are the presence of God. In the shadows, God is with you. He is making you. He is healing you. He's transforming you. And yes, we will someday. Maybe intermittently from time to time we'll break into the sunshine here. But we know that there will be a permanent breakthrough when we cross over into glory. And Jesus comes to bring us home into his glory and his radiance forever. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's give God praise for that. Can we praise him? Oh, God, we give you glory and praise and honor. Hallelujah.